I want to talk about what many people like to refer to as the inner child. What it means, what it doesn't mean, and why it's so important to the individual and to our culture. People throw around the words inner child all the time, but what does that even mean? What does that refer to? The inner child is not exactly what it seems to be. We're often told, get in touch with your inner child, reawaken your inner child, never lose your inner child, have the heart of a child, all these things, and they sound wise, but it's more of a rhetoric that people repeat without really knowing or understanding why they should do so and how it could help them. We have kind of a vague idea. We have an idea, oh, okay, things were better when I was a kid, uh, there was less responsibility, things were more fun. And we have this perception that once you grow up, that's it, you're, you're in the real world and you have to think about adult things and adult responsibilities. And there's this kind of schism that occurs for some of us. We've got this perception, child things are on this side of the timeline, adult things are on this side of the timeline. And when we're told to start thinking about the inner child or to get in touch with your child self or whatever, a lot of the time that's met with a kind of indignance or kind of frustration. Even if part of us finds this idea desirable, it's not really apparent what that means, what you're supposed to do, and sometimes it can actually widen the gap between our perceptions of adulthood and childhood, funnily enough. And the reason for that is we've been told all our lives, okay, you turn 18, now you're an adult, or 21, or whatever age it is where you come from, and that's it. You're never going to get to go back, and we're often chastised for hanging on to things from the past. But there's a kind of cognitive dissonance because we're also told repeatedly that being young is very important, that youth is a kind of resource that we need to preserve for as long as possible, something that will get us jobs and entertainment and friends and love and all these other things. And this cognitive dissonance widens. And what I'm here to talk about is how that's kind of an illusion. How the inner child is not really what we think it is. The inner child has nothing to do with going back in time and reliving that past version of self. That past version of self is gone. It'll always be gone. And I know it's kind of ironic, but you don't really get back in touch with the inner child unless you acknowledge that your past is the past and the present is the present. In fact, being in touch with the inner child has a lot more to do with being in touch with the present. We call it the inner child, but the word child is sort of a red herring. Doing childlike things is not what makes us happy. When we were children, we didn't like those things because they were childlike. We just liked them because we liked them. We were living in the moment. We were living in the present. We don't really think about what we want to be, we want to become. There isn't a reason for any of it. It's just the joy of existing in the moment. Now, becoming an adult obviously can make that a lot more difficult for a number of reasons. We experience all kinds of things. We experience pain and loss and trauma. It's very difficult to remember after a point what it felt like to experience the world before those things happened. Now, obviously you can have external circumstances that are more conducive to a good time, that are more conducive to being in touch with the moment. But ultimately, those circumstances are really just a way of mitigating the surface level of stress that we experience. The inner experience of being present, of having our consciousness consumed with the moment, that's something that isn't contingent on being young. In fact, there are many children who don't really experience it either. We can stop ourselves from feeling that way at a very, very early age. It happens to some children when they're still in primary school. 
And it's not only negative experiences that can have this impact, positive ones can too. The more experiences we have, the further we can drift away from that state of being receptive. And of course, you'll continue to have these experiences throughout your lifetime. They're unavoidable. They started roughly at the age when you became cognizant enough to internalize them. We go through the maze of puberty, discovering where the body ends and the mind begins. And of course, experiences that distract us and take us away from that receptive state of mind. They happen at an exponential rate the older we get, biologically and mentally. This all kind of happens in a tidal wave, especially around the puberty age, just all these experiences rushing towards us. It, it's distracting, it's confusing. We don't really have time to think about, what am I becoming? We don't really analyze the experiences, we just have them. And then once we get past a certain age, these experiences, for a lot of us anyway, they start to slow down. And we often perceive this to be a positive thing, at least at first. We get a sense of who we are, physically, psychologically not so much. It, it takes quite a while for many people to get a really strong mental image of who they think they are. We still have a long way to go in that regard. And our initial excursions into young adulthood are possibly as intense as puberty, maybe more so for some people. And we've still barely begun to understand ourselves internally at that point. Now, this is where the real problem starts, just around or just after young adulthood, for most people anyway. Any age can be the kind of decline of that child self, but for most people it starts at about the early 20s. Young adulthood can be wonderful for some. For some people, it's the most exciting experience of their life. It's a time of experimentation, newfound freedom, sometimes new friends, sometimes new relationships. But for some people, young adulthood can actually be very, very difficult. For some people, it's about student debt and broken relationships and just struggling to stand on your own two feet. We don't really live in a world where things are easy. And, I mean, it's always been that way. We blame today's economy, and that there are problems with today's economy, but we've never really had stable footing for most of the history of humanity, becoming a young adult and working hard as early as possible. Um, but we're in an interesting age now because Youth, mental youth, is extremely valued in this culture. And I don't know if that has something to do with the kind of lifestyle we're living now. A lot of us are biologically younger than our chronological age compared to our ancestors. And by that I mean we age more slowly. We have better diets. We have more infrastructure and more resources to keep us safe. We're kind of evolving in a new direction. And I think this kind of inner child thing is in some ways connected to that. There's sort of an identity crisis involved. In the past, we had a really strong sense of who we should be, what we should be doing based on our tribe's values, what, what the tribe wants from us. Now that's definitely still happening, but the tribe doesn't want the same thing from us anymore. It wants us to work and it wants us to help one another and get involved in all that stuff. So those things are the same, but the way we do it is different. It's not as dangerous anymore. There's not as much mysticism involved. There, there, there's so many layers to the human experience that used to be there that aren't there anymore and so many new layers that are there never used to be. Or at least weren't consistently a part of the human experience until relatively recently. And when you think about the confusion we experience at that age, where we haven't really had many rites of passage, we, we have a kind of lukewarm lifestyle. We work hard, but it's not the same kind of work that the body expects. It's often things like office jobs, or fast food or whatever it is, or just going to university for years and years and just 
a lifestyle in general that doesn't make sense to our bodies. It, we don't really have a sense of what we're doing and whether or not it's right. We don't have a sense of what life is supposed to be. And this gets even worse if you're having relationship problems or abusive employers or maybe you, you waste the best years of your life or at least what's supposed to be the best years of your life on an unappreciative partner or maybe even a friend group that you don't realize until much later wasn't helping you to mature and wasn't helping you to have real authentic connections or real authentic experience of other kinds. So it's sort of the worst of both worlds for some people. We, we don't really have a real sense that we're adults, that we belong to adult society a lot of the time, but we're also cut off from that childlike experience, sometimes a little bit too early. And there aren't very many things in place in our culture to give us a sense of meaning or closure when we get disconnected from those childhood things. We're just sort of dropped in the bucket and told, okay, you're an adult now, start behaving this way. And of course, that's just young adulthood. Young adulthood is a precarious chapter of life because no matter how we endure it, one way or another, we're going to have to face up to the fact that it ends and that it might end bitterly. We might have burnt ourselves out by the end of it. Maybe we partied a little bit too hard. Maybe we didn't party enough. Maybe we wasted it, or believe that we wasted it at any rate. Maybe we feel as though we brought it into the ground, never even blossoming, let alone bearing fruit. And with the incredible pressures placed on us to be productive, to have a house, have children, whatever it is that your society seemingly demands of you, a lot of which is very difficult to reach, and statistically unlikely, we often feel like a failure. And that, of course, deepens the cognitive dissonance. Psychologically, we're kind of in exile. The past is forbidden. The future is uncertain. And the present doesn't exist. We have nowhere to go. Psychologically, there's, there's nobody there. You're just living through life monotonously trying to figure out why you don't feel the way you're supposed to feel. When we get into those states of mind, eventually we're going to start looking inward. We're going to start asking ourselves, what is the purpose of all this? Why do I feel like this? What am I supposed to do? And no matter where we look, inwardly or outwardly, without this part that I've been referring to as the inner child, we're never going to feel complete. It is an absolutely essential part of existence because all this adult stuff, all these jobs, careers, they don't really mean anything. They're fleeting, temporary structures in our lives. They're only really meaningful in the biological sense. And that may seem like it's enough, but if it was truly enough, we wouldn't be unhappy. We wouldn't have this feeling of emptiness. We wouldn't have this feeling of curiosity and hope and boredom. We wouldn't be wondering, why do I feel so bad? What am I supposed to do? Is this what I'm meant to do? As we ride into adulthood, we cling harder and harder and harder to externally generated meaning. We try to postpone the chapter where we start looking inward. We try to keep young for as long as possible. We try to put off the inevitable. We try to think, okay, no, I'm not there yet. I don't have to think about this yet. But in everyone's life, there comes this time when this child self comes knocking on the door saying, you need me. And for the most part, people are really good at remaining deaf to that voice. We're good at tuning it out. We're good at pretending it's not there, but it is always there. And what we need to do is learn how to listen. Now, the funny thing is, children don't care about productivity. They don't care about romance or getting a house or any of this stuff. The concepts of love or careers or achievements or whatever, they're there for children, but they're nebulous. 
they're just kind of a weird simulation in the mind. They don't really mean the same thing as they do to adults. They know they want to experience some of these things eventually, but they don't really feel like they're in a rush. And they certainly don't feel like they ought to be defined by these external things. To them, that would make no sense. It's like, me? Who am I? I'm me. Why do you ask that? You ask a child, why are you you? They, they either laugh at you or think you were weird. It's, it's a given. It's because they're in that state of self. They don't care what the world thinks of them, unless they're getting bullied or something like that. They, as long as their basic physical needs and basic emotional needs are getting met, the child is just happy to exist. It doesn't really have any kind of identity wrapped up in its place in the tribe. It just automatically assumes it belongs in the tribe. And it's the same experience inwardly for most children. They, they don't have any cognitive dissonance about their self-perception or their self-image. The only time children start to worry about these things is when these things are impressed upon them, either through school or bullies or toxic family environments or even just things like commercials that give them ideals at an early age. In fact, the only thing the child really wants is, other than just to have its basic needs met, is to learn and play. And for a child, learning and playing are basically the same thing. When we're little, we often pretend to be things that we might be when we're grown up. We pretend to be policemen or maybe a famous dancer or I mean, obviously children are more inclined to pick the uh, more exciting careers, but, but a lot of child play is kind of a simulation of adult experience, of social interaction, and not even just fun or positive things. Sometimes children play war or they even play death. I've seen kids pretend to have a funeral, for example. So it's really more about what if. They have this kind of very open-ended, very receptive idea of what the world could be, and barely any opinions about what the world should be. And of course, we continue to simulate experiences as we get older. Inventors or artists, they simulate whatever they want to create in their minds before they make it. Or they make prototypes with their hands, but there's always this kind of creative aspect and this kind of play involved. But for some adults, it's rarely satisfying anymore to simulate the real world, real world. Because most adults perceive that we're already in it. And they kind of want to go back to the fake world. Oh, I wish things were simpler. The real world is no longer captivating. The real world is no longer interesting. And this is where people usually get stuck. This is where the inner child starts to drift away. Because what makes a child a child is not the child's interests. It's not the child's toys or the shows that he likes to watch or the video games that she likes to play. None of those things make that person who they are. None of those things make that human a kid as opposed to an adult. The one thing that all children have in common is the fact that they're growing. Being a child means perpetual growth. Yes, there's going to be a few plateaus, but overall, the entire experience is a fluid transition. Now, just for an interesting thought experiment, I want you to try to picture any time in your life that makes you feel incredibly nostalgic but try to picture an adult time, not a child time or a teenage time. Picture an adult time in your life that you have a lot of nostalgia for. And you'll find almost certainly that point in your life was a period immediately before or after a big change. Immediately before you got a job. Immediately after you started dating someone immediately after you moved houses, immediately before you went on some big camping trip. All the times in our lives that we feel nostalgia for are times 
of transition. And whenever we're in a state of transition, that's when we're the closest to the inner child. That's when we're in the moment. That's when we're in the now. It follows that to continue to have a childlike experience, we need to continue moving. We need to continue transitioning. See, a lot of people think that once they've grown up and they reach this kind of permanent plateau, that they're done. Life is finished. There's no more growing to do. Or maybe they don't think that permanently. Maybe they think that for a year and then they get comfortable again. And they forget everything they learned in between. This is something that will happen to us repeatedly and it will never stop. You will continue to feel old, you'll continue to lose touch with the inner child, and you'll continue to have to rediscover it. But what you can do about it is remember the fact that you're growing, that you're moving. You have to remember that you're not just a still statue who's now being weathered. You're a living, breathing organism who is constantly changing, constantly having experiences, and constantly growing from them. While it's true that the more experiences we accrue, the more cluttered we start to feel, it's important to understand that if you're not having that kind of authentic, receptive experience that we equate with childhood, that's not because it's not possible or because some part of you is broken or because life has gotten boring and there's nothing left to do. Quite the contrary. It has everything to do with the fact that you are looking in the wrong place. So let me give you an example. Okay, so imagine you're at a party. Let's say all your best friends are there. Just hypothetical party. If, if you don't have friends in this scenario, you do, and you've had them for a while. I hope you can imagine. But anyway, so you're at this party. Everyone there is someone you like. And you are hoping, you go to the party hoping to have a really good time. And you spend the whole time, the whole party, waiting for that good time to happen. And it just never comes. And some part of you is devastated. Maybe it's your party, maybe you threw the party hoping to have that experience. Maybe you were even trying to relive an experience you had in the past, invited all the same people, same venue, whatever. And it's not the same. Your immediate thought is to think, Oh crap, I'm broken. I'm broken, I can't have the experience I want anymore, I'm dead inside, I'm jaded, life's over for me. And that, ironically, is an incredibly naive thing to think. It's only the naive who fall into this kind of nightmare of believing that the world is over, that they've painted themselves into a corner psychologically that they can never get out of again. It's the wise who are able to perceive that the world is always going to be filled with possibility, that you don't know everything, that you know almost nothing, and that you can continue growing, but you have to allow it to happen. So in this party scenario, you've been walking around, talking to people, trying to force the moment to happen. And you're having fun, you're eating your chips, you're doing whatever, but it's not going anywhere, it's just bland. You don't feel connected to anybody. And then you wander into the kitchen to get more salsa or whatever. And you see the person standing there alone, also getting a drink or food. And you just have a really casual chat with that person. And you start to bond. Maybe it's somebody you don't know as well as the others, or maybe it's somebody you know really well but you haven't bonded with in a long time, and you've sort of taken them for granted. But either way, you're not really expecting it to happen. And then suddenly, you realize that that's your favorite moment of the whole party. It's just this casual conversation in the kitchen, away from the group. And the reason it happened, whether you realize it or not, is because you weren't trying. You weren't trying to feel good. You weren't expecting to feel good. You were just being. You were being in the kitchen, the other person was being in the kitchen, and the moment happened. And some of us, when that does happen, we almost feel gypped, you know? We think, 
Well, what do you mean? I, this isn't how I wanted it. I, I mean, I feel good, but what the heck? What, why is the world like this? What, why do I always feel like I have no control over when this experience occurs? Well, think back to being a child again. Think about the way it felt, sitting on the carpet or on the wooden floor, just playing with a toy. You weren't thinking about the fact that you were playing with the toy. Or if you were, you weren't doing it in this kind of mechanical, monotonous fashion. Everything held a kind of fascination for you. Yes, partly because it was newer. But also because you didn't have any expectations. You didn't want anything specific. And when we talk about getting in touch with the inner child, what we're really talking about is becoming receptive. We're talking about broadening our expectations or doing away with them altogether. We're talking about a state of mind which enables us to step outside of the little boxes and cages that we've placed ourselves in often for benign reasons, just because it's more convenient, because it's habitual. When we do have the experience, usually spontaneously, often when we don't expect it, sometimes it's followed up with a kind of sadness, a kind of acknowledgement, wow, I haven't felt this good in so long, or a scary realization that you've been in this really tight knot for a really long time, or, or that you'd almost forgotten what it felt like to play or create, or have a really deep discussion with somebody, whatever it is. That can be incredibly frightening, and sometimes it can actually deter us from, from having the experience again. We can become more close as a result. And the reason it really frightens us is because we've become afraid that the default state of being is to be disconnected from the core self. We're afraid that whenever we feel connected, it's a deviation. But this is not the case. This feeling of being disconnected is not permanent. The feeling of being connected is the default. That's you. Being connected to you is being you. Being disconnected from yourself, that is the deviation. Now, to give an analogy, you can take, let's say, something like a tiger, and the tiger was born in India, and you move it into North America and the tiger is released into the forest. Let's say, miraculously, somehow it survives. Its entire life is spent in this kind of Canadian-American wilderness, and that is what it's used to. That's what it starts to perceive as its home after a point. But that doesn't mean that its default is to live in North America and not Asia. And whether or not the tiger becomes used to living in that forest in Canada has nothing to do with whether or not the tiger belongs in Asia. Now, the heart is very much like that. The heart can become accustomed to being switched off, but that doesn't mean that you're not experiencing anything in the background or that being switched off is the way it should be or even that you can't become accustomed to have the heart switched on again. Now, we can perpetually chase after nostalgia for our entire lives. We can cling to a past that no longer exists. We can try repeatedly and often sorrowfully to recreate old memories, to have the same party again, to have the same trip, to play the same video game again and hope that it feels the same. We can keep doing that, and we might have some success sometimes. But even when we do have success, it won't be identical. There will always be this little pang, this, this awareness that, okay, this isn't quite the same, this isn't quite what I was looking for. The alternative is to accept the moment exactly as it is. Accept it for all its flaws, all of its sadness, all the grief and loss, all the bitter disappointments. Accept all of that and remove the expectation that it should be different. Remove the expectation that you're supposed to feel good. Remove the expectation that you're supposed to feel the same way you felt in the past. Now, I'm going to kind of repeat myself if anyone's watched my Zelda 
psychology and philosophy videos. You've heard this already, but getting in touch with the inner child is not the reconstruction of an egg once shattered. Getting in touch with the inner child is your salient realization that right now you're inside an even greater egg, and beyond that, perhaps another. Reawakening the inner child is the realization that your egg is broken. And we need to stop lamenting the first or second or third egg, whichever egg we felt was the tipping point in our lives, and recognize that we're waiting to be reborn. We're waiting for this incredible awakening. And also to realize that we can't force it to happen, but we can make our lives a little bit more conducive for this experience. Part of that, in fact, the largest part of that is to have an authentic experience inwardly. To try your best not to view your inner experience through the lenses of what should be and what has been and what is supposed to be. To reawaken the inner child is to recognize that you're growing. It means no longer denying that growth. It also means recognizing that there are seasons in life. Understanding that change is inevitable and that we're always going to go through these periods of winter. And more importantly, if you're feeling disconnected from your child self, it probably means that you're in winter. It means that you're awaiting spring. Perhaps you've been in winter for a very long time. Perhaps you're in autumn. Perhaps you've been in autumn for a long time trying to delay the winter. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because we're terrified. We're terrified of acknowledging the change. We're terrified of thinking, wow, that's really over. Wow, she's really gone. Wow, I'm really getting old. Wow, I'll never have that experience again. All those things, we, we that's winter. That's what we don't want to think about. But the thing is, when we start to embrace those things, that's when we actually make room for spring. That's when we have that kind of inner rebirth. That's what gives us this authentic feeling of self, of presence, of change and growth, and even contentment. It's what enables us to appreciate spring when it comes. When we accept that winter, we're no longer looking for last year's summer. As soon as we stop looking for last year's summer, we clear off the slate and we actually experience this year's summer or this year's spring or whatever it is. We stop viewing through the lens of what should be we begin to recognize that we're not a plant that has borne fruit and then withered. We're a whole forest filled with trees and plants that continue to flower and bear fruit and go through their respective seasons. That's what keeps us stagnant, that perception that we have one chance. We have one chance of happiness and it has to happen at a certain time. We have to be willing to negotiate the terms by which we receive this happiness, by which we receive this feeling. We have to be willing to negotiate our dreams. And you may be thinking, that's not really fair. I feel like I've never really gotten my way except when I was a child and now I can. And that's very understandable. But at the same time, children do nothing but negotiate the terms by which they receive happiness. Now, that, that may seem untrue at a glance. It may seem like, oh, well, children just think of me, 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 I want, I want. And on one level, that's true. They don't really want to experience things through this or that lens. Yes, they want the thing. and Yeah, they probably want it now. They don't usually compare this year's thing to last year's thing, at least not until the cluttering process has begun. And that, I mean, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, how positive experiences can also clutter us. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept that having negative experiences can even cause us to appreciate the positive ones more. And that doesn't mean that we should have negative experiences regularly or anything like that. It just means that the cluttering process that I've been describing it's not caused by negative or positive experience. It's caused by expectation. So anything that deviates from your expectations in a way that you perceive to be more or less positive than your expectation is going to have an impact. 
So in summary, what I've been trying to say here is that getting in touch with the inner child means experiencing the moment authentically. And experiencing the moment authentically means removing expectations. It means we're no longer trying to force the moment to happen. It means we're aware of the fact that we can experience the moment, often randomly, could be in a parking lot, could be in the grocery store. It just happens when it happens. And we can't really control that. Letting go of this desire to control it, ironically, is the only thing that makes it more likely to happen. Reawakening the inner child means acknowledging that we're never going to be the same again. But what remains meaningfully consistent is this authenticity, is this receptivity. And the more we experience that, the less we're going to care, the less we're going to miss these things from childhood, at least in the same way. If you want to reawaken the inner child, you have to accept you have to be open to the possibility that what feels good, it's not what you're doing, it's not who you're with, it's not where you are. It's your receptivity to those very things and your receptivity to the inner experience you're having alongside those things. Reawakening the inner child requires us to suspend our disbelief. It requires us to surrender to the idea that we can't control our external experience. It requires us to embrace and acknowledge our inner experience.